In today's video, we're gonna go over some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. Shit's getting weird. Part infinity. We're looking at Oscar, the first human modular prototype that is able to live in various settings. What's going to happen is that I'm going to connect the brain to the heart module to activate the blood circulation. Now, the lung is going to start breathing. You can see both organs are now collaborating. I can add a kidney module. And if I add a limb module, I start actuating the organism to move. Now it's looking for the optimum temperature, which is 37 degrees. If I add another limb, Oscar will recognize it and benefit from the disability. Amazing. Crazy, freaky, scary, all in the same time. I would say slow down, but... Yeah, we're cooked. This has got to be from like a movie or some kind of prop or some sort. I'm not sure if any of you guys know what it is exactly. Let me know in the comments because... That just looks horrifying and not right at all. Saying that something was 20 years ago today does not mean the same thing that 20 years ago. Love this video. Yes, time does move differently now than it has in the past. And I have two really good examples of that. First example is this movie, The Wedding Singer. This movie came out in 1998 and it was set in the year 1985. And when it came out, all the people that had lived through the 80s, at least the ones that I personally knew, were obsessed with it. They thought it was so nostalgic and just perfect, and which it is because this movie is amazing. But the point is, when that movie was first released, it was being nostalgic for a time that was only 13 years in the past at that point. And to put it in perspective, that would be like making a nostalgic movie for 2011 now. And I just don't think it would work. In 2011, we had the iPhone. Sure, it was more limited, but we still had smartphones. We still had HD video, YouTube. We even had Instagram. Yes, everything was more limited, but we still had social media. We had the internet essentially as we know it. And so I just don't think it would hit the same as 1998 to 1995 did. 13 going on 30 has an even bigger time gap. This movie was released in 2004 and is about a girl who is 13 years old in 1987 and she wishes she could skip time to become 30 years old. Her wish comes true and she wakes up as a 30 year old 17 years later in 2004. And when she wakes up, there are computers and cell phones and basically the whole landscape of the world has changed. So in this case, if we wanted to make that movie now, we'd have to set the start of the film in 2007, which was 17 years ago. And while things were a little different in 2007, we still did have cell phones and the internet and YouTube. In fact, the iPhone was actually released in 2007. And while a 17 year time jump might work a little bit better for a nostalgic movie, it still doesn't seem as near as big of a time jump as 2004 to 1987. So in conclusion, I personally believe that time, as we perceive it, started to change in the early 2000s and really took off after 2007 and 2008. I understand what this individual is saying. It's much more difficult to get a nostalgic feeling from now to the early 2000s because there's so much that's already the same, but not quite. If you go back and look at commercials in 2007 compared to now, way different. Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And if you see this graph here, you'll see that 27% of the viewers that watch my videos are actually subscribed to the channel, while 72% of the viewers that watch my videos are not subscribed, but keep coming back for more of my content. So to the 27% that are subscribed to the channel, thank you so much for being subscribed. And to the 72% that are not subscribed, I still appreciate you nonetheless. Thank you for watching. Hey, 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 listen, this is so important, y'all. Real quick, I've been doing some studying. And I, let me flip this camera around. Okay, so I typed this out because I really wanted y'all to see that this is not something that I'm just coming up with. This is the beginning of the curriculum that I started, the power of words, shaping our reality and positive thinking. Intro um impact reprogram and creating positive reality but i gotta get to something because i just feel the need to tell you this right now the word children chill ren 
Chill Ren is made from two words. Chill Ren. To chill something. Chill means unpleasant or even to or frighten so. Okay? So, it, just that word beginning. Chill. Unpleasant. Why would we want to call our Ren, the angels that came through us, anything that has to do with something being unpleasant or frightening? Ren. Now, this is the thing. In English language, English grammar, Ren is not found. You have to look in the English, Eastern languages to find Ren, which means the untarnished, perfect, clean, good, benevolent, loving nature of a zygote. A zygote is what the spirit or Ren flows into at the time of creation of birth. This is an Egyptian word. So when we call in our children, children, we're calling them a chilled wren, an unpleasant or frightened spirit. And so for wren, the wren did not belong to the man, but came out of the celestial waters to enter an infant in the hour of his birth and might not stir again until it was time to go back. A wren, you guys, is a hot spirit. That's why they want to chill our wren. And if you keep going down, the word kid came from the word kidling, which, which also means killing. Kid is not a native English word. It is early borrowing from Old Norse kid, which means young goat. And its descendants can still be found in modern Scandinavian languages. Killing, literally kidling. In Swedish, also meaning young goat. This term has been used in reference to children only. This is a word they gave us to call our offspring, to call out an animal spirit in them, to kill their spirit, to chill their spirit, y'all. And even the word baby. The word baby is a word that is used as a pet name for animals. They're using these animal spirits in our wren, and we have to change our language if we want to make a difference. Peace and love. I've never really gone this deep into name casting or spell casting, I think is what they really call it, uh, where they take different words and put meanings behind them that actually mean something to suppress an individual. I really would like to know if this is something a lot of people believe in, because I personally, I never really thought of this type of thing before. It, it's kind of new to me. I am very interested in it to know what all of the other words potentially mean and is it really affecting us growing up or is it affecting people when we do say certain type of words? I, I would like to know what is your guys' thoughts on this because it's pretty interesting. Explain the Philip experiment. Just oh, so people the don't Philip know. experiment. So in the early 1970s, it was Toronto in Canada. There was a group of researchers slash scientists. Their thought was, can we create a haunting? Do we create hauntings? So what they did was they came up with this whole profile of a person who had lived and died. Then they started to conduct essentially seances. You know, they would say, OK, do this thing if the answer is yes. Do this thing if the answer is no. And they knew the answers because they had written them. And the objective phenomena that would happen would correlate with the ghosts they created and the answers that they knew that they had written down. Did they create it or did they invite something in? Mm. Or is it just, you know, maybe they got it wrong and it's just totally explainable. Yeah. But that's the Philip experiment. Okay. I have often wondered if when someone tries to contact a spirit or an entity from another realm with a Ouija board or however they try to do this communication, are we really communicating with another spirit or demon or are we manifesting this to become a reality and it's just a whole new entity altogether not spirit not demon just some other fabricated creature that we made into existence because we were wanting it bad enough it, it really does make me wonder if that's the case because Who's to say that our minds are not so powerful if we believe in something strong enough that it would not happen? Let me know in the comments on what you think about this because it's an interesting topic, but I do not think a lot of people believe in it. I think that they truly believe in when you're using these types of devices, you are contacting other spirits from a different realm. Major warning for iPhone users. So if you have an iPhone, trust me, you need to see this video right now.
So over the last couple of weeks, Apple have been coming out with some warnings, which is very reassuring considering most people have an iPhone. And if you do have a Samsung or an Android, you're probably the lucky ones for once. Now please make sure you share this video with anybody you know that has an iPhone, which is probably everyone, because they need to see this and you don't want to be responsible if the worst happens because you didn't share it. So they've basically said, be careful if you see an orange dot in the corner of your screen or a green dot. Now what does that mean? Now an orange dot means that your microphone is being used and a green dot means that your camera is being used, which obviously isn't great and could be an indication that your phone or device has been hacked or that somebody is just listening in or watching you through the camera. Now, just to put your mind at rest a bit from that, if you used any apps like Snapchat or the camera, anything that uses your audio or uses your camera, like mine's green right now because I'm filming a video, then obviously it's going to be on while you're using it, right? That's what it's there for. But if you then close down Snapchat, close down the apps that were using it, it should go away pretty quickly. So yes, keep an eye out, guys. Stay safe. I'm sure it'll be all good. But yeah, hit that follow button and I'll keep you updated. I don't necessarily see this deterring people away from the iPhones. It's actually a good thing to have those kind of notifications to let you know, hey, my camera's running or hey, my microphone is running. Because maybe you're not intentionally doing it and someone is tapping in. I do like when I use my iPhone, it does show that I'm using my camera and it does show that I'm using my audio and I think that that's comforting in a way because you kind of need to know if something like that's running. Now the problem is, is if like this individual says, if you're being hacked, if someone's really a hacker, they can disable those lights and you would even not know that someone was listening into your audio. Gen Z says boomers will never understand today's struggle because they could afford to buy a Cadillac off of a $30,000 salary and be able to qualify for a home. Why can't you just admit that it was easier 30, 40 years ago? I am 36 years old. Just 15 years ago when I was 21, living in Los Angeles, one of the most expensive cities in the country, I was crushing it making $2,200 a month, serving at the Outback Steakhouse just four days a week. Me and my buddy split a beautiful two-bedroom apartment. Our groceries were $50 a week a piece. We used to go to breakfast three days a week. We used to go to the bars three days a week. We furnished our entire apartment. We used to go buy DVD sets. We had disposable income. We were saving money off of $2,200. We were never worried about bills at all. And then $100,000 back in the day, just 12 years ago, you were crushing it. When I first made my first $100,000, I went and got a BMW. You know what the monthly payment was? 333 one of the nicest apartments in LA, a two bed, two bath plus loft was 2300. Today, 2300 is a studio apartment. You need at least $200,000 to fill the same purchasing power as you did just 12 years ago with 100 grand. I don't know why the boomers can't admit that. I mean, personally, I know a lot of older people that definitely admit that it was easier back in the day than it is current day. I just don't think they talk about it very often. <laughs> So if you ever walk through a rich neighborhood at night, you might have noticed that a lot of the homes don't have fully covered windows. And for me, like I've always found this to be kind of exciting, like it's a chance to look inside at like a nice kitchen or living room. Um, but recently I started wondering whether this was part of a bigger phenomenon, like are rich people actually less likely to cover their windows? And I actually found this study that was done for the Department of Energy that basically concluded that people who earn more than $150,000 a year are almost twice as likely as um, people who earn twenty to 29000 a year to have uncovered windows. Um, and the exact numbers depend on the income level, but the general trend is that the more money you earn, the less likely you are to cover your windows. And so you might be wondering, like, what's going on here? And so I talked to a bunch of experts to try to get to the bottom of this. And I think the big thing happening here really is just that rich people have more windows. And so if you have a lot of windows, the stakes of leaving any individual one uncovered is just not as high. Um, I also think there's an element of heating and cooling happening. Window curtains are essential for heating and cooling a home. And if you have a lot of money, the like cost benefit of covering your windows just isn't as high in the first place. But then I also think that we're seeing uncovered windows become kind of a status symbol of their own. Like we live in this time in which um, basically we really value natural light and we really value these like big windows that make us feel connected to the outside world. And only certain people can first of all afford that and second of all feel that kind of comfort with just like exposing their home or their apartment to everyone around them. And I think that's what's happening here. I think the uncovered window has become the status symbol in American life. I wouldn't say that the open window has become the status symbol of American life, but it is really nice to have your windows open because it's refreshing. You get cool air, you get nice summer air when the time is right. It's just 
really good. It just depends on your neighborhood. I wouldn't take it as far as saying it's a rich people thing, but it is a nice thing to be able to do. What is a time crystal? A regular crystal is a material with atoms arranged in some repeating pattern, like snowflakes or salt. A time crystal is a material with a repeating pattern, but in time. To be a true time crystal, this behavior would have to last forever without needing energy to continue. A kind of perpetual motion, which sounds impossible. These aren't really perpetual motion machines, by the way, because there is a bit of friction here, meaning heat, which is loss, and it makes noise, which is also loss. Very basically, how time crystals work is the particles are excited and get stuck in that state. And then a laser hits them, which makes the particles spin back and forth over and over and over. It uses no energy to do it, no decay. So instead of abiding by the laws of thermodynamics, like everything else in our big world, time crystals play by the rules of quantum physics. Time crystals do not exist in nature. They are entirely man-made. And they haven't been lasting very long, maybe a few milliseconds. But researchers have recently created a time crystal that lasted 40 minutes, which means these could be made to last a lot longer. We would use them in things like quantum computers, chips, memory, but also to amplify the light waves that pass through them, meaning they boost communication like for your Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I've not heard of a time crystal yet like this especially, and I'm curious on how it works exactly. Like I would like to see the science behind it actually being implemented because that just sounds futuristic it basically like she said it's a perpetual motion machine in a way but it's not it's in time so I, I would like to see the science behind that because that's beyond my capabilities of knowledge that's <laughs> a woo what is iPhone finger? The way we hold our phones, sometimes with the weight of the phone resting on your pinky oh. finger, oh, yeah. has hurts? created an indentation and has oh. actually changed the way your pinky looks. So look at your dominant hand, <gasps> the hand that you hold your iPhone with, and compare it to the pinky finger <gasps> on There's your a other dent. hand. I got a dent in my finger. You have iPhone finger. What? I don't know. Both of my pinkies seem to be pretty straight. I don't really hold my phone. Th like, I, the way I hold my phone is like this, and then I normally use it with one other hand. I, I never really... I'd be too afraid to drop my phone if I did that. That's too much. But I do know some people that have a specific pinky formation depending on how they use their computer. Like, your pinky can actually bend just like how these guys were talking about with the iPhone or the phone. That might just be people using technology a little too much. It's starting to deform our bodies. <laughs> NASA owns the rights to the interior of the Great Pyramid. Man. They also own the rights to a section of the Grand Canyon. Took the helicopter down into the Grand Canyon. Uh, they said, we can't walk to this area. Area I heard had old carvings or something would be over in this area. So I started trying to walk that way. And this guy pops out of nowhere with all black on, black hat, black military outfit with no logos and AR-15 and tells me, halt, you can't go any further. I'm like, why? I said, what's going on? Well, didn't they tell you you couldn't come over here? I said, well, they did, but I'm thinking, you know, I just want to see, you know, what's over here. Can you just tell me, sir, like, why can't I come over here? He says, NASA owns the rights to this section. You can't come over here. Do you have any theories of why that is? This got to be technological. Starts at something with space. And then also, where, where else? Chaco Canyon. Same situation. They actually own the rights to those those round former things that look like they might have been domes or whatever. Mm. And now there's no dome, but you can see those round circles. So it's like, so wait a minute, what's going on here? I really would like to know what's going on in the Grand Canyon. I find it extremely interesting that NASA owns portions of the Grand Canyon and they have actual security guards with full-on automatic assault weapons. It's what are they really protecting? Are they protecting ancient technology or are they trying to protect something else? Maybe a creature? I really would like to know. And I have a feeling we're going to hear so much more about the Grand Canyon in the next year or so. It's, it's going to be crazy. Where's the Garden of Eden? Well, uh, when you read the stories, right, the, the thing that strikes you is that it's so specific. Like, it says things in talking about the Garden of Eden, that, wait a minute, if I can't find what you're talking about, this isn't even real. You see what I'm saying? We're like, like, where the Garden of Eden was, there's, I think, four rivers that come from it, and then it names two of them, like, 
I don't want to be specific, because at least he's going to bring it up, but it's like the Nile and the Euphrates, right? Right? So you know two of them, and it's saying, you know, where the four meet, this is where it is. And, um, yeah, my whole life I was like, ah, this, this is really weird because that one period of time we're thinking no flood happens is so many things that have lined up from these great religious books yeah, and we, where we can see that, no, something happened to here. Something happened, and these are stories of people telling stories that have been told to them for about a thousand years. I'm curious as to where, really, if there is a Garden of Eden, where is it at exactly? If any of you guys know, please leave a comment down below. I would like to think that maybe one of the reasons why they try to keep us out of Antarctica is because that's where the Garden of Eden is. That's probably where a lot of supernatural or biblical things are. That's where it's being held at. But who knows? Maybe it's not. Maybe it is near where Cat Williams said it is due to the Bible. But I'm curious. God has literally imbued every atom in the entire universe with this divine consciousness. And we know now through every single individual atom, it has electrons orbiting it. And those electrons can make conscious decisions based on observation. We know this because of the double slit experiment in quantum physics. That means that everything made of atoms is conscious. So this whole universe is one entity experiencing itself subjectively as ghouls and Googles of entities and things that exist and things that we think are inanimate. And so it's all about understanding that we are God and God is us. It's in everything and we're in everything. And separation, separation is an illusion. Division is an illusion. Distance is even an illusion. Everything is actually all one. We've been given this grand experiment through the third dimension uh, to experience the illusion of these things. But in reality, it's all about sending information back to source. And it starts with us. We all are God walking in the flesh. There's only one consciousness. I found this pretty interesting, and I kind of agree with the concept that we ourselves are God as well, because God created everything, including the atoms that we are. And it, it makes sense to me that if there's a God, we would be a part of God because God created us, right? Let me know what you guys think about this. I know a lot of people really do not like this individual, but I really think he had some pretty good words to say to this, and I, I agree. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here today. I'm really sorry it was cut short. I have a lot going on outside of YouTube right now. I'm also trying out two cameras because I like to look around a lot when I record videos. So if you enjoyed the two camera aspect ratio, let me know in the comments because I have fun with that, but it is a little tedious to work on, but I do really enjoy it. It's fun to do. And as always, if you are interested in any of the clips, links are in the description down below. And with that being said... Have a good day.